just a reminder, you could always open up Cinema 4D by going new, max on Cinema 4D file inside of After Effects. So I found where Array was. So I'm going to just put a cube down. So right here is Array next to the spline tool. You'll notice it's saying there's seven copies, but we're not seeing anything. We need to drag the cube into the array. Now we've got our array. And the array is very interesting. You can do some pretty fast, powerful, interesting things with it. And the second I show you, you'll you'll recognize what I'm talking about because you've seen it in commercials and stuff like that. So basically, it's like the repeater in After Effects, but you can animate the radius and the amplitude, things like that. And we could also change the coordinates, the rotation, and the scale in here. So I'm going to go back to the object. And I'm going to click the radio button for radius, move forward a little bit, and then increase the radius. And that will spread them out further. Like that. And then I click the button one more time. And I've got my keyframe animation done. So that's one thing you can do with it. I can also start, I'll click on amplitude. And then move forward a little bit. Raise these up a little bit on the Z. Click Amplitude again. And that's what that's doing now. So if I go over to Coordinates, I could also pick a rotation. Let's try right here. I'll click there. Move forward. And then rotate it. And click the radio button a second time. So I just hit the spacebar to preview it, and there's my animation. Very little time to get something eye-catching and fancy. So you can already see some of the possibilities of working with an array to get some very interesting motion in 3D. Okay, so that's the array. And always feel free to experiment with the properties panel whenever you add something or change it. There's lots of little menus for you to go diving into. But just remember the basics, position, scale, rotation, and you'll do fine. Transparency is not too much of play um, in 3D. All right, so now we're going to move on with the new stuff. I'm going to go to front view. So that's going to be under camera, front. So now I'm working at a straight on front view, which is always best when you're trying to freehand draw something. Now I'm going to keep this short and sweet. Uh, I'm just clicking and dragging, creating curves, and I'm going to make a little loop like that. And I hit escape a couple times, and now I'm off of my pen tool. And what we learned last week is splines will not render because you have to extrude them. So if I hit the render, there's nothing there. So there's my spline. So I'm going to need to do an extrude. I'm going to want to do an ex a sweep extrusion. So I'm going to hold down Alt, click on the extrude. Hit sweep, and then I'm going to add the profile for this sweep, which is going to be a circle, but that's going to be from the splines. So I'm going to add a spline circle, and I'll put it right there. So it should go the extrude, the shape of the bevel, and then the shape that you drew, or I should say the extrusion shape. So we go to my object, make that smaller. Let's try 20. OK, that's a bit better. And now we've got something. If I want to edit this, object mode, have my selector here. Start seeing the path again. Okay, so we've got that set up. Now we're going to get a little fancy with it and tackle some motion with this. So the less points you have in a curve, the smoother it's going to be. And it was turning off this check right there. 
that you can see where each spline point is. So again, I can move it with the arrow tools. And I'm going to show you what happens here with this little cross through in a moment. I'm going to turn this back on so you can see the shading lines. One of the things you're seeing is the lines are all different lengths, and that's not going to give you a nice smooth shading. So I'm going to do garage shading plus the lines so we can see those. So I got garage shading lines on. I'm going to go to the properties panel. And right here, intermediate points, I'm going to change that from adaptive to uniform. And watch these lines. See, like from here to here, it's short. That's even shorter, and that's very long. So the second I change from adaptive to uniform, now all those segments are the same size. So that's going to give you a cleaner geometry and smoother shading. So that was selecting the spline in object and changing intermediate, intermediate points from uh, adaptive to uniform. So now they're all going to be the same size. That's the first step. And then if you increase the number of the geometry, you'll see the lines get even smoother if some of your curves look a little jagged. But remember, the more geometry you have, the longer your render time is going to be. So that's just some stuff to keep in mind. I'm going to click on my sweep generator up here on the top. And again, remember, you don't need to do 3D at any point in this class. I'm just giving you a brief introduction to 3D. And just this week, and then we're done it. All right, so I've got my sweep generator selected. And... I'm going to change the setting for details right here. There's scale and rotation. Scale over time and rotation over time. For scale, I'm going to drag this point down. And you'll see it's giving me a taper. So that's scaling that end, and this is scaling that end. Okay, That's what that's going to do. But it gets even more interesting in a second. I'm going to switch to an orthoscopic view real quick. Uh, let's do perspective. I'll zoom out a little. OK, that's a little better. So now if I do this, you'll see how it's tapering in 3D space. Right, so that's that's a pretty cool option to have. And what you can do next if I want to taper a little bit here and a little bit there, and I'm going to rotate my camera around, this is where it gets interesting. If I hold down Command or Control, I can add points to get the thicker thin to change where I want over time. So now it's getting a little thicker here where it was getting thinner before. Same with that section. You just move around in the graph and watch the thickness of your stroke change over time. So that's how you use that function. So I'm going to click back on my sweep generator. OK. If I'm going to be drawing a complex logo, I can hold down Command or Control, click here and drag, and it duplicates that whole hierarchy. I'm going to hit on Duke because I don't want to go wasting everyone's time by doing more than one sweep generator tonight. Just like with materials, anything you click on and command or control drag will duplicate it in whatever panel you have selected. So like I said, if you want to have consistent strokes and materials, then, you know, that would copy all of that for you. So I'm going to fix this part right here, and I'll show you what I mean by that. I've got intersecting geometry, and I don't want that. I'm going to click here. 
Let me click on my spline. There we go. So with my spline selected, hit undo. There's my spline. I'm going to use the move tool right up here. I'm going to zoom in here. This is my closest line. So I could either choose to send it forward or backward. Okay. I click this check mark to hide the 3D. But once I found the point, it's easier for me to look and see that it's not overlapping anything that way. And I can check and see. Yep, that's good. If I want to fix things like that, I can bring that out that way. But like I said, usually drawing in a straight on front view is easier for you. I just wanted to show you once you start doing true 3D, you got to watch everything so that your mesh doesn't, you know, overlap the way it was doing before because that's that's unprofessional looking. All right. So. That was just with the spline selecting, click that check mark so I could see where the spline points are using the move tool and moving them around. And that's your basic workflow. So I'm not going to eat up too much of your time tonight with this, but I'm going to show you how to do a trim path for this. So you can do trim path effects when you've got a sweep generator and I'm on my sweep generator and it's start growth and end growth. See how that's going like that. So I move my playhead to where I want. The start is the first line I drew. The end is the last line I drew, just like in After Effects. So I click on the radio button I want to animate. I go to whatever amount of time I want. Make the change. And then I click the button again. And now I've got a 3D trim path. So when I rotate in 3D space and rewind it, you can see it truly is a 3D trim path like such. This is your timeline area, but you can see that the keyframes, you really can't see them. So when you want to dive into your keyframes, all you have to do, hover over any of the radio buttons that you animated, like this one right here, right click, animation, show track. In 3D, what we call the timeline in After Effects, they call the dope sheet. These are keyframes right here. So if I select all my keyframes like that, I could easy ease them by hovering over and finding easy ease right here. Now they're easy eased. I could speed it up or slow it down by dragging this bar. So now it's going even faster or undo that. like such. So I just change that a little bit and then I just close out of it and then I preview it. There's the easy eased sweep trim path. Also, let me click here. I'm going to right click and do F curve. This is sort of like the speed graph for our keyframes. So I can make more of an S curve there and that'll change the timing, the keyframe velocity. You see now I've got a more extreme slow out. So just remember when you're doing 3D, you can select the vertex, vertices, the lines or the faces to edit them with your transform tools. Sort of like Illustrator in, in 3D space. All right, so I'm going to delete this material I made earlier and go create material, new standard material. So for a cartoon shader, like the traditional cell based animation, you want a highlight, a midtone, and a shadow, but you don't want gradation between them because, you know, basically it was drawn by hand and there are three different ink colors that they use. So you don't want that gradient. So you want that harsh, you know, tritone look. So I've got new, my new material. You double click to open and edit it. And 
if I were to drag it onto the spline, it would apply to material. We'll go do that in a little bit. I'm going to turn off color and reflectance. I'm going to turn on luminance. And this will start to give us a flat look. Like already there's no shading. So that's part of the battle is already done. I'm going to close out of here real quick. I'm going to add a light to the scene. Let me delete this default light. I'm going to hold down. I'll do, I'll do a target light. Okay. I'll just move that up a little bit. Like such. Zoom in a little. Okay, I'll go back to my material now that I've got a light in the scene. I'm going to have this light I put in the scene affect my material. So to do that, this little drop down here. So I'm still in luminance. There's texture. Here's the drop down. I'm going to choose effects, lumas, and that's the amount of lightness. And we can see now we've got a little bit of shading going back on again. I'm going to click once on the color swatch. It goes right next to it. I'm going to set my illumination to 100%. And we can see the material update in live time. And this is the jumping off point for our cartoon shader right here. I'm going to click on luminance again. And you can see lumas is in the texture drop down panel. I'm going to click one more time on the texture drop down and choose colorizer. I'm going to click on the color swatch one more time. Now I'm going to crush this by dragging the sliders. And you can see we're already getting a harsher look. You can also click and drag there to get less of a gradient step in between the two. So that's looking pretty decent. Remember, you don't want a lot of tone. That's why I, I crushed that. Another thing you can do is we can blur this to soften it up a bit, to have a little bit less dithering. And for this, I clicked on the arrow by the word gradient to get to this section. And I'm going to hold down shift and select both of these arrows. And right here by the interpolation, I'm going to choose step. Now we're getting somewhere because there's even less gradation happening. I can now slide these arrows around to fine tune my look based upon what I want. Let's try about there. So now I can start coloring it. If I click on the black color, let's do blue for this. So it's hue, saturation, and value, like how much light or dark is in there. So I'm gonna want a little bit darker color there. Okay, good. And for here, I'm gonna make a brighter highlight about there. So we've got a highlight and a shadow, but no midtone. If I click in between these two, now I've got my midtone. So I don't want it as dark as the highlight or as bright as the highlight. So as dark as the shadow, as bright as the highlight. That's pretty decent. Let's select all three of these, slide them around a little bit. I'm going to want less highlight and more midtone. Pulling down shift to select both. Slide them down a bit. Give a little bit more of the shadow there. OK, I'm happy with that. That's a little bit better looking. It's all juggling acting. Like I said, I blurred this a bit and I can now close my material editor. These arrows will take you back and forth between your various windows that you use to create your material, by the way. All right, now I can drag this either onto the shape or onto the spline. I'll put it on the spline. Go back to garage shading. Let me delete this light, don't want it there. Okay, now it's showing. So now, based upon the light, I'll add another light. Now you can see how we've got that 3D cartoon shade look with the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. So 
adjusting your lights in the scene will now affect the highlights on your model. So if I go and I increase the intensity of this and preview it again, that's a little too hot. Let's try 150. Render it again. Still a bit too hot. So that's a pretty quick way of getting that traditional animated look with a tune shader, just like having a tri a tritone and having the light interact with it. But there is no fast way of seeing your light. That's one of the ways that this uh, speeds up its rendering is by, you know, giving you a loose idea of what it's going to look like. And then you got to hit the quick render to see that. So uh, any questions on any of that, like, you know, using a sweep to create a uh, trim path or editing materials? Because, you know, it's a lot to take in, but, you know, you have to have a little bit of an introduction to 3D and, you know, working in a 3D workspace. All right, cool. So I can delete all this. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put... Pol no, not a polygon. Uh, let's try a torus, a cylinder, a cube, a pill, a pyramid, and a cone. These are all on my origin point. They're all at the exact same spot in 3D space. Does everybody understand that? They're like basically stacked on top of each other at the same location. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down Command or Control and duplicate this tune shader so that I've got six of them. Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six objects. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to change the color. For this quick color change, I'm only sliding the hue. I'm keeping the saturation and the uh, value just to get a quick color difference so you can see it by eye. Almost done this part. Red, green, blue, yellow. I'll do an orange. And then a purple. And then we're all done with the materials. Well, now I got to apply them. Let me add light to the scene. Okay, so I'll put blue on the cone. So now these are color material added to them. They're all on the zero point in 3D. I'm going to use MoGraph to scatter these. It's sort of like the array. This is working with multiple different shapes with multiple materials. So it's a little bit more powerful than the array. The array is more like a repeater in um, After Effects. So I'm going to select all of these. Choose MoGraph. Fracture. And I need to drag them into there. Oh. There we go. Now they're inside it. So they're parented to there. And I'm going to add an effector. So go MoGraph effector. And I'll choose random. When you have the full version of this software, it's far more powerful. But the light version, you can... Uh, get away with some pretty interesting stuff to it. So I'm upping the strength and already you see the stuff is starting to spread out. Okay. So my objects are parented inside the fracture MoGraph. The effector 
so the fracture MoGraph is parented inside the random effector. That's the way this is working. So if I select the effector and then down here, I've got all these parameters that I can adjust. There's the effector strength, minimal, maximum. If I click here and go to the effector tab, that's popped up there, showing that it's parented. Let's see what happens if I... Okay, so that's affecting all of them inside of it. And here's the effector right here. And we've also got noise, which is sort of like a wiggle expression. That was with the effector selected in the effector mode. So that's another way of getting that. Turbulence does the same thing. It animates it. So let's see what happens if I... Okay, that's going to be there. Let's try coordinates. That's all of them. Okay. I'm going to keep that at straight. So if I change my effector from turbulence back to random, I can now start trying to mess around with these a little bit more. I can also start affecting the rotation of them as well. I can see if I could have this start affecting things as well with the effector. Oh, wait, one more thing. Let me look for it. I'm going to click on indexed. If I click on indexed and I change this back to noise, now it's going to keep them all separate inside the noise. That's the one button I'd forgotten was the indexed for the noise. So if I just hit the space bar, I've already got something random happening. And then you can adjust your settings, the speed, the scale, things like that. So that's yeah, just a quick introduction to a little bit of motion in uh, Cinema 4D. And then Thursday, we'll start morphs, tweening, and audio from keyframes from audio. So we're officially done 3D for the class. And with this free version, like I click the gear to change this, you cannot render full quality uh, 2K out of this. You've got to do it through After Effects. So you got to link them together with Live Link. A uh, board game I was trying, thinking about either doing the, the movie introduction or an introduction, introduction to the game. Okay, just bear in mind, it can't be a copyrighted property. So it's like you can't do Clue no. or Monopoly and you can't do anything Star Wars or Harry Potter. Okay. No, it's something that I uh, came up with myself. Okay, great. And if you've got yes. artwork for it, that'll help you out too. Yeah, I have a lot of artwork for it. Um, something I'm still recommending. I, um, a couple of semesters ago, I brought it to, um, to Professor Jones. Because um, I was trying to see if I could use it for my final project, but um, he said he would think about it. But I'm still trying to push it to see um, uh, when I take it to him if I can get the okay. But um, okay, well, if you're depending yeah. upon how the, the quality of your artwork is, what's going to help with like you know your little intro for this. Like if it's got humanoid characters, you can character rig them and and move them about and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. You know, so just remember, whatever artwork you're doing, you want to have it layered so you've got full control over everything in the scene. 
Oh, okay. That's always first and foremost. Because uh, I'll do a quick recap here. It's like uh, uh, yeah. Hmm. No, I said I would definitely buy buy another one Thursday. I think I'm, uh, I should um, figure something out. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a quick little recap here. Um, so, like, say you're doing an arm. I'm going to do all squares just because, you know, it's fast and easy. Uh, obviously, the first step is I'm holding down Commander Control using the pan behind tool. So that'll be my upper arm. Uh, Command D or Control D to duplicate it. Move it down to where it'd be. And then, uh, then I'd add a hand. So let me deselect that. And we'll say that's the hand for whatever reason. So that'd be the shoulder. Uh, that'd be the forearm. And this would be the hand. And yeah, I got to move the hand anchor point, obviously. OK. So let me make these all different colors just so we can see it faster. You got to have the selection arrow for that. OK, so. The forearm would be parented to the shoulder. The hand would be parented to the forearm. So if I rotate my shoulder the way it would on the arm, uh, the, the body, the whole arm moves with it. But you also have full control over when and where the other body parts move. That's why I'm saying whatever you do, make sure you've got layers so you've got full control over the motion of everything. Understand? Yes. Yeah, because if this was just an arm, you wouldn't be able to bend it like that. So that's why it's good to break down things that you can move them the way you want. Sarah, I saw your storyboard and I was just making sure it's not a whole lot of video to it. Like, you know, there's other elements like you layering out a scene with photos and things like that, correct? Okay. Yeah. This ties into something Sarah was talking about doing. Um, I actually already have these up here. If anyone wants to experiment with them or, or take a look at them. So in Canvas, you just go to our class, Files, Art 228 Virtual, All Slides and Art Files, Ink Videos. And there's a whole bunch of inks that you can experiment with. Um, I think I've already got one downloaded. Let me double check. So I'll just randomly pick Ink 6. You just click the little dots, the hamburger, and choose Download. And... We've already covered alpha mats. Does everyone remember alpha mats? I'm going to make this full res. So we'll pretend this is the title of my movie, OK? And I'm going to go file, import file, or just double click in the empty spot, bring in my ink. Now, go drag it in here, and let's take a look at it. This is ink drops being dropped into water, video clips, but they shot it against white, OK? So if I scrub through here, you see what's happening, OK? If they shot this against a green screen and we, remo we removed the green, we could use as an alpha mat. But this is tone, white, grays, and black. So we can use it as a luma mat, OK? So the mat goes above. You know, like you put a mask over your face. Here's my text. I'm in my switches. I need to be in my modes. I clicked switches and modes. The layer below that's going to be revealed, I choose Luma Mat. Now watch what's going to happen. It's going away, okay, because of the way this was shot. So if I just choose Luma inverted, now it's being added on, okay? So everyone's seen that effect before. And that happened pretty quick. If you want it to be slower and more cinematic, I can right-click the video clip. This only works with video clips. Time, time stretch. Now, if you look at the original duration, it's 10 seconds, and there's new duration. So if I change this 100 to 200, that slowed it down because it's now 20 seconds, so it's half speed. Now it's coming in a little bit slower, okay? So that's one way of bringing in different elements. And like I said, in Canvas, this is the path to those. I'm going to click out of it. 
I've also got for people to look at uh, leaders and light leaks, light leaks and lens flares. The number one rule of motion design is show, don't tell. So you might say, well, what's a leader? What's a light leak? And while I'm waiting for those to download, I'm going to go over this right here. Let me zoom in. Okay. So I have the movie clip selected in the project panel. Above the project panel, I get a thumbnail that shows me a little bit about that clip. Then it's got the name, how many times it's used in my animation. But more importantly, it tells me the aspect ratio. This is a 2K video clip. 1920 by 1080 is 2K resolution. 1.0. That means this was shot with a digital camera. Digital cameras use square pixels. Old film cameras used rectangular pixels. It's 10 seconds long. It was shot at 29.97 frames per second. It's in color and there's no audio. Okay. So that's just some of the information we can get looking in our project panel. I'm going to bring in all of those. There's my light, my lens flare, my leader, and my light leak. I'm going to put my title on blue just so we can see what's happening here. I'm making a new solid, make it a little bit darker, put it behind. And the title is going to be colored by the ink. The ink is black and white values. That's why it's got some black text. I could probably tint it if I want to, but all right, let's start off with a light leak. I'll throw that over top. Light effects work best with a screen blend mode. because so that's going to get rid of the darker color backgrounds and blend it over the text. Okay. So where this stops, I can hit command shift D to split the layer. Take a look at my next light leak, which is starting about here. I'm going to trim the beginning of that. That's what the next leak looks like. And I can just keep going until I find one I like. This one. So I'm going to do that. So there's my fancy stuff happening. Then a light leak comes in. It stops there. So I trim the end of the layer. That's a light leak. Leaders, you see this says volume. You've seen these at the beginning of old films. So I could trim that there. And now make my timeline a little bigger. Okay, so that's good. I can select these, slide them down. So there's the leader. Let's have it stop right here. And I could even probably change the blend mode. Let's try multiply. The multiply gets rid of the white at the end. So now I've got my leader and that multiply removing the white. We've got a little bit of that leader grunge happening. Let me drag that out a little bit longer. See like that. I could even drag it out longer if I wanted. Then the light leak comes in. I'm just showing you different ways of dressing up your video. So that was the leader, the light leak. Last is trusty old lens flare. And I'll put that right here at the end. This is a light effect. So I'm going to want to use a screen blend mode to get rid of the dark part. And they have it. A little bit of texture, a little bit of lens grit. 
add a little bit of life to that still image. Now let's play it back. Leader, right there. I could trim out that part whenever I want, but I just chose to have that there. Blending mode gets rid of the white. There's our Luma inverted matte. There's our light leak. And there's the lens flare. Three different ways to dress up a design we already just did. Any questions on that? No, that's really cool. And thanks. And all of those, like I said, there's tons of this stuff I put up here for you. Just basically your jumping off point is files, R class, all slides and art files. And in there, there's the ink videos, leaders and light leaks. There's light leaks and lens flares. Yeah, that's basically those four folders of stuff I put in there. So there's lots of stuff for you to mess around with to get fancier transitions or, you know, bring a little bit of life to it. Now, let's kick this up a notch because that's what we do here. So that's looking pretty cool. Um, I could probably even get rid of the beginning of this leader if it's a little too, you know, over the top. I could change the endpoint of it. Select everything, slide it down. If I hit the, no, oh, don't want to go doing that. Just hold down shift to snap it. There we go. Okay, so we got that happening. Now, what if? So here's our light, light, light leak right there. So if I duplicate my text one more time, duplicate. Is that the light leak? Yeah. I could set that to an alpha mat. And we should see, you know what? Let's take off the screen and change it to normal. Let's hit undo. Oh, I see what I did wrong. No one called me out on it. Did anyone catch it yet? Is the mask not on top? I don't know. Yep, that's exactly right. Oh, cool. I just have to switch my layer stack. And I could change this to normal if I want to make it really pop. Alpha mat. Now it's going to be inside there. See, now it's even more intense. And it's just inside that type for a little bit of liveliness. Like such. So that's just showing you different things you can do. You could put light leaks and lens flares inside of alpha layers, you know, or you could have it affect everything on the screen. It's your call as a designer. I could probably even drag this out if I wanted to and really go wild with it. Like I said, you know, it's all about experimenting, pushing your ideas, but still having motion design in there. It's not just about visual effects and compositing. You want to have some good, clean motion in there as well, rather than just, you know, all gimmicks. It's like right here, there's just too much dead space. Like I would... So I'm going to go page up. I would cut this here, split that layer, scrub through. It's If you're going to use elements, make sure you're using only the best, like the best of the best. And I'll start that there. You don't want any uh, dead space or boring stuff in there or accidental things.
that's just using the Luma mat, uh, Luma invert mat over a photo. Since this photo has no alpha, I'm going to try and use extract to get rid of the white background. Pre-compose this just so there's no confusion when I'm doing my VFX. And I just use that silhouetted pre-comp as an alpha mat for the lens flare I put inside the image. So it's really just think about your workflow and how you want to dress up your, your motion. All right, I'll see everyone Thursday night. Have a good evening. And if you have any uh, ideas or more storyboards to show me, make sure you reach out to me via email. Thanks.